Let's talk the future of Windows and Surface. Today's podcast is sponsored by Devolutions, whose remote desktop manager helps you maintain security and productivity. We'll have a little bit more from them here in just a minute, but let's dive in, shall we? Because there's a lot to talk about. It is Thanksgiving here in the U.S., so if you're not from the U.S., maybe you didn't you know, have a whole bunch of turkey this week and mac and cheese if you're down south or green beans or casseroles or anything else, but hopefully you had a healthy, safe, and happy holiday, but there's a lot of Windows and Surface news to be talking about here, so let's just dive into Windows first, because what does they they, they, meaning Microsoft, have on the agenda for 2021. If you remember, Microsoft said, hey, 2020 is supposed to be a year of reinvestment into Windows. And uh, we don't really, really know what that means exactly, but we have a vague idea. And now some things are starting to materialize. And so here's what I've been hearing in full transparency. Uh, Zach has also been hearing very similar things, which is good because then we have multiple sources hearing very similar things. And so that is a good, uh, that's a good thing for reassurance. So on the agenda for Windows 10 in 2020, and we're talking Windows 10 proper, what I've hear, what I've been hearing and others have been hearing as well is that the first update that we're gonna see in the spring, pretty much nothing. Typically, Microsoft had previously done pretty large updates in the spring and then smaller like patch and fix updates in the fall. And then that update would be uh, supported for 30 months, especially in the enterprise. That's a big deal for the consumer. Not so much. You just grab the updates as they come and kind of deal with the bugs if they exist. And so that might be changing. It looks like the first update is gonna be pretty small and and then the one in the fall is going to be pretty large. Uh, that's also where we're hearing things about Sun Valley, which is a UI enhancement or update or refinement, something along that line. So keep your eyes and ears peeled for that. Um, but that's going to be sort of the big stuff. There's also going to be, I believe, um, uh, some ARM stuff on the Windows 10X side. So let's just dive into Windows 10X because I think that's where a little bit more interesting, a little bit more conversation can be had. And so uh, x86, 64-bit app support is coming to Windows 10X. We've already known that. That's already been talked about, but that's officially going to arrive, I believe, next year. Uh, Windows 10X, the first iteration that's like, you know, ready for retail is expected to be done uh, right around like now. So sometime in, the, in December, I think they will officially like, you know, rubber stamp it and say, this is the first version we are going to start shipping um, an RTM, if you will, although Microsoft doesn't refer to R2M, but that's exactly what it is. They'll, they'll just give it over to their partners, who, by the way, I believe are going to be the only ones who can actually install Windows 10X, you know, officially. I'm sure some very smart people out there will be able to get their hands on Windows 10X and figure out how to shoehorn it onto other devices. Um, and speaking of those devices, you might be wondering, are they running Intel or running the, are they running ARM? And I think they're going to be a mixed bag of both. Now, initially, Microsoft was only talking about Intel devices, but enough time has passed, and I've been hearing enough whispers that ARM is, if it's not right out of the gate, it shouldn't be hopefully too much longer. I know the the work has gone into making that uh, that model work, and I know that um, Qualcomm is again on board for stuff like that, and so be on the lookout for that. And as we know, it's going to be single screen devices. So what we're going to have here is a single screen device running Windows 10X. And then you're going to be thinking about what about my classic apps, Brad? What about I want to run Photoshop? Well, I honestly want to run Photoshop on this stuff. Anyways, but Microsoft is working on a technology um, that's going to allow you to stream Win32 apps from the cloud to these devices. They're going to be super thin client um, style. If you, if you understand that reference, meaning like, hey, if Microsoft does it the way they uh, dreamed it up, is you effectively open an app. As long as you're connected to the internet, then there's an instance in the cloud that will stream that down. Now, the business model there is a little interesting because I'm not quite sure how that's going to work yet, if it's going to be requiring Microsoft 365, something like that. But anyways, these devices are definitely targeted more at the Chromebook level. Don't think high-end, high-end compute. Think more uh, entry-level, low-cost, low-maintenance type scenarios. Now, there's been some, this kind of sounds familiar. If you remember the app streaming stuff, remember the HP Elite phone? It's not exactly the same. Don't, it's not, it's a very similar idea. Remember the HP Elite Windows phone that you could actually stream apps, Win32 apps for when you were using desktop virtualization? Well, this appears to be a very similar model. And so be on the lookout for this. This is going to be the big deal next year is definitely going to be seeing how Win Windows 10X is one positioned to how it functions with all this technology baked in and three, how Microsoft honestly markets this thing. Because I'll tell you, I have some pretty genuine concerns because tell me if this sounds familiar. You have a version of Windows 10 and a, a version of Windows 10 that can't run Win32 apps natively. It still can kind of sort of run them. Um, it's only coming from OEMs and it's only on low end devices. It kind of just feels like Windows 10 S all over again. And so I, 
I know there's going to be some UI differences, and I'm not trying to like boohoo this thing before it gets out of the gate, but Microsoft kicked off Windows 10X with this grand vision of the, the Neo device. It's a dual screen thing. It had this fancy new UI. It was just a total remake of Windows. And what we're, what we're getting here is like Windows 10 S2 or Windows RT2 or something like that. I don't quite know exactly yet. And this is why I'm not diving all down the rabbit hole of negativity because we got to wait. We, we Candidly, we need to wait and see how Microsoft positions this um, to see what really is going to be happening here. And so just, you know, just be on the lookout for Windows 10X. I think that's the story to understand because what is going on in the background of Windows 10X is going to be a driver of potential innovation across Windows 10. The, my problem is, is that the lines look a little blurry. And so we'll see, we'll see how this all shakes out. Uh, but that's what you're looking at. So quick recap, look for a bigger update for Windows 10 proper in the fall. Uh, Windows 10X, look for ARM support. Uh, look for Win32 app streaming from the cloud and look for it to arrive on Chromebook style device is sooner rather than later. I don't know if we're going to hear a whole bunch about this at CES, but uh, we will we will find out. Now, moving on to Surface hardware. Surface is obviously a big brand inside of Microsoft, and they have these two products. I should have grabbed one and been more appropriate. They have a Surface Laptop 4, and they also have a Surface Pro 8. Now, they were originally, I believe, expected to launch a little bit ago, but because of everything going on in the world, and Microsoft launched a whole bunch of stuff in October, they've been bumped a little bit. And I think we're going to be seeing them here very, very soon, um, potentially as early as mid to late January, but I was initially here in Q1 uh, was the launch time frame. But we will see here... Um, you know, what is going on. But here's a quick look, thanks to, again, Cozy Planes, he found these images. Uh, this is a Surface Laptop 4. And as you can see, if you're thinking like, hey, it doesn't really look any difference, like that's kind of the point. This is gonna be a very minor refresh at the end of the day. They're just gonna upgrade the internals and we're gonna see an Intel processor, I believe 11th generation. And then we're gonna see some of the newer AMD chips, which is sorely needed because the AMD chips, I believe they were the 3000 series in the old Surface Laptop 2, um, were way, underperforming and, and just overall disappointing, but the new AMD stuff should be pretty top notch in a laptop. So I have high expectations for them, uh, for the AMD version of the Surface Laptop 4. So be on the lookout for that. And then we also have the Surface Pro 8. Actually, one of these things already ended up on eBay, a Surface Pro 8 prototype, which I don't know who bought it or what, what the final verdict was. Um, but again, don't look for any major re refresh. I'm surprised that they're still keeping the same design, but Microsoft apparently is just going to try to refresh the internals and the clearly they think that is the right maneuver and they're keeping the same classic design and not really going uh, out of the box here uh, when it comes to upgrades. So there you go. There's your first look at the Surface Pro, la Surface Laptop 4, excuse me, and the Surface Pro 8. If you're watching or listening to this on the audio version, it might be worth checking out the video just to kind of see the pictures. And so this is your first look at the new hardware that should be arriving here in the relative near future, which is a good thing. Gives us something to talk about and curious to see what Microsoft does if they really, uh, really do anything uh, different out of the box. So before we jump on over to the gaming news, let's have a quick word from our friends over at Devolutions. Remote Desktop Manager helps you centralize, manage, and secure access to remote connections, tools, and passwords on a single platform. Streamline your daily workflow with powerful automation tools and securely launch remote sessions without even seeing the credentials. No more pesky sticky notes with passwords on them. All right, let's dive into the gaming news. There's not a whole lot this week, right? We're in a holiday week, so you're either looking for Black Friday stuff or whatever. Um, but there is one major bit of news. So there was a report out from a Digital Foundry that was talking about how uh, the performance of the Series X honestly just wasn't quite living up to the hype, depending on the title. And Microsoft has beaded their chest significantly saying the Series X is the world's most powerful console, though the world's most powerful console. And they said it's got a lot of teraflops. It's got more than the PlayStation 5. And then when it comes, you know, when the pudding arrives at the end of the day, and it looks like the PlayStation 5 is on par and in some games beating Microsoft's top end console, which doesn't really make sense from the narrative of the marketing that we have been hearing. And so The Verge was able, actually able to pin Microsoft down and got an official quote from them. And they said, we are aware of performance issues in a handful of optimized titles on the Series X and S and are actively working with our partners to identify and resolve the issues to ensure optimal experience. As we begin a new console generation, our partners are just now scratching the surface of what next-gen consoles can do and minor bugs are expected as they learn how to take full advantage of our new platform. We are eager to continue working with developers to further explore the capability of the Xbox S and in the future. Now, that's a pretty... Most 
mostly a dodge of the actual conversation about why some of these titles are not uh, performing better. And Microsoft just basically puts it down to optimization. Um, digging in a little bit further, I can tell you it, it directly relates to a couple things that overlap, but it's a little bit easier. One, the game development kit that these developers were able to use was certified in June, so there was a, a quite a bit of lag. Uh, Microsoft has already told us that they didn't start mass production on their consoles until like late summer, so it was after the certification of that. They were also waiting for some... The, nobody has clarified yet exactly what technology Microsoft was waiting for from AMD to be finalized and certified and ready to go, but I'm guessing it has to do with RDNA 2.0. That is my my guess. Um, in that these are just launch titles that launched on older stuff, and Sony um, used, utilized a lot of the same development architecture or uh, APIs and, and programming knowledge from the PlayStation 4 Pro over to the PlayStation 5, and it helped developers make that migration earlier. We also know that PlayStation devs got their development kits significantly earlier than what Microsoft was dishing out, especially to third parties and so when you couple all this stuff up um, this is the, the optimis that optimization is what Microsoft is referring to per my understanding uh, people who are, are digging into this stuff you also have to take a look at DirectX 12 ultimate which is again was not I mean it was finalized and talked about but being finalized and talked about and developers implementing it to the fullest capability are two completely and wildly different things I still fully expect that as we get into more mature games that are truly native console builds um, for the next gen stuff that the place or the PlayStation 5 will underperform the series X I think that is a pretty that everybody knows that there's more raw horsepower inside of the series x that is a given right now that there's no disputing that what is up for debate right now is who is able to take better development care or development of or i should say utilization of that power right now on the playstation 5 playstation side i'm stumbling all over my words it's much easier based on the how Sony developed that architecture and the development kits. Microsoft side, it's a little more complex because they're also working with not only the consoles, but the PC side. And they're also factoring in things like game streaming. And while not all of those things correlate to lower performance, it just makes things a little bit more complex. And so um, people were like really freaking out over this. And I think it's just kind of like, you know, just we're two and a half weeks in to the console launch. And I think people need to just kind of relax and, and let it run its course. If we're in here for a year from now, and this is still happening, that I I think I think we could probably say that Microsoft screwed up a little bit, uh, especially with some of their marketing and or development kits. But I would fully expect as these platforms mature that the, the difference between a PlayStation 5 and the Series X will expand. It's just going to take some time for that difference to mature. And like I've said time and time again, the PlayStation 5 is a 600 horsepower car and the Series X is a 700 horsepower car. The difference there, while significant, at the at the fringes is only where you notice that overall they're they're very close um, at the end of the day. So that's just kind of the gaming news wrap up. And so it has been an interesting week of just a lot of Microsoft like big heavy hitting stuff, but none of it's really like concrete if you know what I mean. Because we we've got this vague idea uh, of the roadmap for what's going to happen for Windows next year, and then we also know what's coming down the pipeline for for 10x. We also know what's coming early next year for the Surface lineup uh, with the Pro 8 and the Laptop 4. And then on the Xbox Series X side, we're sitting here kind of just twiddling our thumbs waiting for Microsoft and their developers to take full advantage of the hardware that is going to be under the hood and that is going to take time to mature there's just no other way to describe that and so with that friends uh, I'd recommend you take a look at the link down below from my friends over at Devolutions and their remote desktop manager they've been a sponsor of this podcast and a longtime friend on um, just on a personal level and so I very much appreciate them hanging out with us for the past couple weeks and we'll catch all of you right back here next time